Hi everyone and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. Today we're going to talk about, as you can see, the action potential. Okay, so um, we're going to be trying to get a handle on some very difficult topics by comparing uh, these new concepts to things that you already know. And as you know, that's a, that's a theme that I have. Um, we're going to talk about some good stuff and some bad stuff dealing with uh, action potentials. So. Here we go. This is, of course, where it all happens. This is a giant multipolar neuron. And uh, as a quick review, neurons are unidirectional uh, signaling devices. Um, this is the input end. These are the dendrites. Dendrite means tree-like. All of these signals coming into this neuron will come in through the dendrites and then be focused on one spot, which we're going to look at here, the axon hillock. Um, you can also call that the trigger zone. If this trigger zone reaches threshold, then this neuron will fire. And what that means is we're going to send an action potential down the axon to the axon terminal, shown down here. And in this case, this neuron is talking to um, another neuron. But of course, neurons talk to all cells of the body, not just other neurons. In, the, in this video, we're going to try and get a handle on what kind of signal the action potential actually is and um, how the neuron actually codes for information. Um, of course, the nervous system drives people crazy because you're talking about uh, changes that happen over milliseconds, thousandths of a second, and uh, movements of ions, which are you know not really easy to visualize. So this kind of looks like a mess, but as we try and look at what the ions are doing, primarily sodium and potassium, um, there are two main forces that are responsible for their movements. So let's try and break this down a little bit and see if we can get a handle on it. Um, the first gradient that's going to cause the ions to move in any particular direction is one that's very easy to recognize. It's a concentration gradient. And a concentration gradient goes from where particles, or in this case children, are to where they aren't. That's the direction of the gradient. So, you know, basic diffusion, you can look at movements of, you know, uh, uh, food coloring in a in a beaker of water, you'll see the same thing. So everything moves from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration until equilibrium is reached. So when we talk about an ion uh, or any particle, but in this case an ion's concentration gradient, that's what we're talking about. Things moving from where they are to where they aren't until there's an equilibrium point. The other gradient that we have to worry about is a voltage gradient. And all you got to remember there is this is a basic uh, property of uh, opposite charges attracting each other. So similar charges repel each other, but opposites attract. So now if we go back to this um, figure of a, of a cell in cross-section, and we start to look at these particular ions, um, it hopefully makes a little bit more sense when you break it down. So let's look at sodium. For sodium, the story is actually pretty clear because sodium is being concentrated all the time by this 3-sodium-2 potassium pump and it's being concentrated outside the cell. So what this pump does, it's an active transporter, it's powered by ATP. Every time an ATP molecule gets hydrolyzed, three ions of sodium get pumped out of the cell and two ions of potassium get pumped in. So this is what creates the sodium concentration gradient. That is why there is so much sodium, you see it all out here, why there's so much sodium outside the cell and basically none inside the cell. There are leak channels for sodium, but you notice that is blocked when the cell is at rest, and that's critical. Um, the other thing, the other gradient, of course, is the voltage gradient, and you notice that the cell at rest is inside negative. That's what all of these negative signs represent. Um, and the cell is positive outside, of course. So for sodium, the story is pretty clear. The driving force for sodium, the combination of the voltage gradient and the concentration gradient, drive sodium to want to go into the cell very, very badly. That driving force is actually quite high. So that's the reason why sodium has such a strong desire to get into the cell. Another way of looking at this, in a little table format, what we've just said is that the concentration gradient for sodium drives it in. That's based on where sodium wants to go because of its numbers, just being concentrated. Um, in numbers outside the cell means it wants to go in. Based on the voltage gradient, sodium also wants to go in because the cell is inside negative. And sodium, of course, is positive. 
The story for potassium is a little bit different. So potassium is always being concentrated inside the cell because, again, of this 3-sodium-2 potassium pump. The same pump, of course. Every time an ATP molecule gets hydrolyzed, two ions of potassium get pumped in. So the concentration gradient for potassium is outward. But look at the voltage gradient. It's the same voltage gradient that we just saw, right? The cell is inside negative with respect to the outside. So for potassium, the story is a little bit unclear. If you add the concentration gradient and the voltage gradient together, what you actually get is a small driving force outward for potassium. In other words, that concentration gradient effect is a little bit stronger than the voltage gradient. But again, just to compare for the purposes of clarity, I hope, the concentration gradient for potassium is outward. That's based on numbers where potassium wants to go. But the voltage gradient wants to keep potassium in. In other words, potassium, just like sodium, is a monovalent cation. So its, it's happy point is being surrounded by negativity, right? So it would actually like to stay in. So you can see why the, the, the degree of the driving force for each of the ions is different. Okay, so let's put all this together. Basically everything, all the signals coming into this neuron are going to be focused. All of the changes in, in uh, membrane voltage get focused right here at the axon hillock. The axon hillock really is the magic spot. And if that particular spot on the cell body reaches threshold, this neuron will fire. And if it doesn't, it won't. So this is what we're going to look at um, in terms of the, the graph of millivolts on the Y, the membrane potential, how inside negative or how inside positive is the cell, and then we've got time in milliseconds on the, on the X. What I want everyone to notice is that normally textbooks will draw a membrane at rest or a dendrite at rest. Um, as a flat line, usually they'll average it around minus 70, so that's inside negative minus 70 millivolts. The truth is those dendrites are constantly getting information, like I said. And what kind of information is that? Well, from any given point on the Y, you have two choices, right? You can go up or you can go down. That's pretty much it. So from minus 70, when the neuron gets any kind of information that pushes this down, that is to say, making the cell even more inside negative than it already is, we call that a hyperpolarization. You're taking the polarization, the inside negativeness, if you will, and you're making it more, right? Hyper means more. That's one type of information that the cell could be getting. On the other hand, this can also deflect upwards. We're making the inside of the cell less negative than it already is, or more toward inside positive, depending on how you want to look at it. Any kind of uh, signal that does that, we call a depolarizing stimulus. So those are really the only options. That's the kind of information the neuron will get. Now what this all comes down to is, will the cell be depolarized? Will it come all the way up to threshold voltage at the axon hillock? Yes or no? That's the part of the neuron that acts like a switch. It's either on or off. So when we look at all this, we say, oh, all this is when the cell is at rest. And all that means is, you notice it's not, it doesn't look really restful to me. It's going up, it's going down. So again, here, right here, it would be depolarizing. Here, it's hyperpolarizing. The cell is getting information saying, no, 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 don't fire now. But look what happens. It's getting depolarized and depolarized. It's getting less and less inside negative, And it's getting more and more closer and closer to threshold. And finally, at this point right here, something amazing happens. Sodium gates open. Those are voltage-regulated sodium gates. And sodium, if you recall, is the ion that wants to get in so badly, but the membrane at rest is not permeable to sodium. But all of a sudden, at threshold, these little proteins in the membrane change shape and allow sodium to come in. And boy, does it ever. So here are these sodium channels all of a sudden open, all of the sodium rushing in due to the concentration gradient and the voltage gradient, and wow, that causes the upsweep of the action potential. So if you think about it, this part of the action potential is due to the fact that sodium is rushing in, making the cell more and more and more inside positive. Now where sodium actually wants the membrane to be, that is the equilibrium value for sodium is way up here, um, way above where the, the uh, 
neuron actually ends up. Um, why it wants to go so high? Uh, you want to watch this video on driving forces and equilibrium potentials. This video really explains why the ions want to go um, where they do. So check that out. Anyway, back to this. Um, at the peak of the action potential, two events occur. The gates for sodium, which opened at threshold, now close. And now we've got tons of voltage-sensitive potassium gates. They open. And now the situation for potassium has, has changed dramatically. Now the situation is this. The concentration gradient for potassium is outwards, which it was before. So in that sense, it's just like rest. But what has changed is the membrane voltage. Remember, at rest, the cell is inside negative. But at the peak of the action potential, it's now inside positive, right? Sodium took it to inside positive. So now potassium, kind of like sodium at the very beginning of the story, now potassium has a huge driving force. Both the concentration gradient and the voltage gradient are pushing potassium out. So potassium now floods out and that's what you see is what we call the downsweep of the action potential. That is potassium leaving. Wow, where potassium wants the membrane to be, its equilibrium value is way down here at minus 90. And again, to understand why that is and what that means, you want to check out that uh, driving forces video. Okay, so we've got an action potential. Now what? Now we've got to spread the love all the way down the axon. So what happens is, as you look at the entire length of the axon, and remember axons can be extremely long, every single region of depolarization, it's just like a, a line of dominoes. That's going to cause the next region just downstream to depolarize, and you're going to get action potentials all the way down. But there's a little problem. Actually, what I learned in Jamaica is uh, there are no such things as problems, just situations. We don't call it a problem, we call it a situation. The situation is that current uh, is not unidirectional. Current change in a membrane will flow both upstream, that is to say back towards the cell body, as well as downstream. And that's a big problem because those neurons have to be unidirectional signaling devices. So the solution to this problem is rest. It's called a refractory period, but it's basically a resting phase. So what actually happens as you look down an axon, here's a region that's going through an action potential right now. As the action potential spreads, it does influence both the region that just fired as well as the region that's going to fire next. The reason why this region does not fire again is because it can't. It is having its resting phase. So what you look at down here in the pink is that this region is recovering from the action potential it just had. That's why it can't fire again. There is actually what we call an absolute refractory period, during which time the excitability of the region of the membrane is actually zero. That means no matter how strongly you stimulate this region, it cannot have an action potential. And that's because it's basically having one, right? This is the action potential. These are the two ions that are involved. It has to, in a sense, reset. This is a relative refractory period. This shows the time, you notice it's only a couple of milliseconds long, right? When the excitability is slowly increasing, and now it's perfectly excitable again. In other words, now it's back to its original excitability state. So the refractory period is what prevents the action potential from going backwards. And that's pretty cool. Another problem, I mean, uh, <clears throat> situation, is that signal strength decreases over distance. And like I said, axons can be extremely long. If you've worked at all with electrical wiring, you know that we insulate electrical wires with a single piece of insulation. We cannot do that with an axon. And that's because the axon is so long and the signal is so weak that if you actually expected to send this big depolarizing signal all the way down an axon, by the time it gets to the end, I mean, this could be, the cell body could be in your spinal cord and the axon terminal could be in your little toe, you know, and by the time it gets that distance, um, the signal would die out. So what we actually have is a situation where through the myelinated region of axon, you have only the depolarizing stimulus. The problem with that 
even though it goes very fast, is that it does decrease in strength over distance. But that's okay because at the next node of Ron VA, that's where the action potential will occur. So the signal gets re-energized, if you will. And then the next region that's myelinated, you get a very fast spread of depolarization. It's fast, but it dies out over distance. But that's okay because now we have another node. And so at every node of Ron VA, the signal gets re-amplified. And a lot of people do think of the nodes as little mini amplifiers. And that is what prevents the loss of the signal intensity over the entire length of the axon. It's because the nodes of Ranvier act to amplify the signal all the way down, which is pretty cool. Boy, my voice is tired. I know that's a lot of information. Please comment and subscribe. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. And visit us on Facebook and Twitter. Good luck.